I'm uh, Simon Wesley. I run the King's Centre for Military Health Research at King's College London, and I'm also Chair of Psychiatry and Vice Dean at the Institute of Psychiatry. So I'm basically I'm a psychiatrist, an academic, and a researcher. Well, the main one was on data protection confidentiality, which is uh, because of my actual kind of day job doing big studies in the population, for example, the British Army, uh, is a great interest of ours. So I'm very interested in all the areas around security, electronic case records, and uh, confidentiality issues, data protection issues. And also, because I'm a, an academic and a, and a clinician, we do randomised controlled trials to see what treatments work for what people. So with the Starfish project as well, I was uh, involved at the beginning of that. Well, you know, as, as, as anyone who does research and interacts with the public, one is often struck that people do have very strange ideas and you hear about, you know, human guinea pigs and issues like that. And, you know, whereas my view is things like randomised controlled trials are a fantastic way of helping the healthcare of the nation. And therefore anything that comes along that gives you an opportunity to uh, explain to people um, of all shapes and sizes, to be honest, not just children, but all shapes and sizes, exactly what scientific and medical research does and uh, overcome some of the many misperceptions that people have and to also get people to be active collaborators in the project that we're involved in um, is something I don't think any scientist should, should ever turn down. Oh, it's great fun. I mean, first of all, it gets me out of the office and, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day drudgery um, is, is anything that breaks up the routine is fine. And second, you do interact with people and you do realise that some of the preconceptions that I have about what people think about our jobs are, are not quite right. And also to, to help and, and explain to people what, you know, the, the structures and, and uses of medical research are, I think is also a benefit. No, it was, it was a great fun. Um, beats the kind of committees that I spend my days on and uh, was thoroughly enjoyable. Yes, I, th I, think th I think the Starfish project worked very well because it actually dealt with two things, both of which are very close to my heart. One is the issue of randomised controlled trials and um, trying to understand what it means when we ask people to take part in a clinical trial and why do we do that. But the other, of course, was the actual example that they were using was very much in my neck of the woods, which was about psychiatry and mental health. I mean, they could have used many other examples as well um, because, you know, randomised controlled trials go across medicine, but actually the example they were using was on mental health, which is obviously what I do for a living uh, as a psychiatrist. So it was a kind of a bit of a double whammy for, for people like me, really. I think I think in in the in in the Starfish project there were you could pick on any one and maybe twelve issues because you know the issue of medical research plus the issue of mental health covers a huge number of kind of hot controversial topics. But I think first is the issue of um, why do we do trials? What is it about a trial that makes it unique? And the the way in which we're trying to explain through the script. You know, what is it that's so important here and why aren't there other simpler ways of finding out why, what do we do? You know, everyone thinks there must be another way of finding out if our treatment works. Well, actually there isn't. And I think that was important. And then with the issues of consent and particularly in sensitive issues like mental health, you know, can you truly get informed consent? How do people understand what it is that you're trying to do and what it is that you want them to do? And the mixtures of research and treatment that, that come together. And at the end, I mean, I would say, you know, as ever, it didn't come to a firm conclusion because I don't think in those areas there are always firm conclusions, these kind of grey areas of mental health and medicine, which is why they're so interesting. I think it was. Um, this is a very contentious issue, and it was clear from the kind of, kind of the expert briefings that you ran beforehand that there is not that much consensus between people involved in this area. And even among experts, I still think there's a remarkable misunderstanding of, of how you know, researchers use medical records for public health. Um, so I found that actually even more, more enjoyable simply because um, there was big disagreements between the panellists, if you wish to put it that way, uh, not just with, with, with the people we were interacting with. I think there it's a question of the two almost irre irreconcilable goals. On the one hand, people have the right to privacy and nothing is more private than your medical records. On the other hand, however, medical records are one of the most important ways we have of improving healthcare and the health of the public. And indeed, I've gone on record as saying I actually think electronic patient records will do more for human health than the Human Genome Project. Now, 
But how do we get over this balance between privacy and then this, the invasion of privacy that research can sometimes be for a far greater good and subject to safeguards? So it's the kind of getting over this check and balance thing. There is no absolute right to privacy. There are many instances in which we will and have to use medical records without consent. On the other hand, we have absolutely no automatic right to do that, and it's subject to a whole very, very complicated series of checks and balances. So it, it's an area for grown-ups. It's not an area that leads itself to absolute simple, this is right, this is wrong. And I think they did get over that very well, that uh, this is an area for, for reason and balance and proportionality, and those are often difficult concepts to get, get over. There isn't a right and wrong, there isn't a winner or a loser. I think, you know, the, the, what theatre brings is that, you know, we live in an age where people like narratives, they like stories, they like to be ident identify with characters. And I could lecture till I'm blue in the face, and to be honest, it would make very, very little difference, to be quite frank with you. I sometimes wonder why we do it at all. But if you can make it into a narrative that engages people, and that they can identify with the characters and the dilemmas they face, that's clearly a much more powerful way of getting over the complexities of the arguments that we have here. I, I think, um, you know, I imagine everyone is going to say the same, but in 10 years' time, you as an individual will probably have your, your genome. Your GDP probably will, you probably will in the next 10 or 15 years' time. I think no one really has the remotest understanding of the impact that is going to have in ways that we have not foreseen, and many of them I think will be deeply undesirable. I think that has to be the biggest challenge um, that we're going to face in the next decade. I suspect everyone has probably come up with a similar answer, but that would be my, my number one priority. I think it's a, a brilliant project that is bringing into a much more open and accessible format some of the major issues that we face in science and healthcare.